On September 16, 1920, just seconds after 12 o'clock noon, a horse-drawn carriage came to a stop in front of the J.P. Morgan building on Wall Street in Manhattan. The streets were flooded with workers who had just been dismissed for lunch. The driver of the carriage climbed down and hurried away. And while the bell tower of a local church ringing in the 12 o'clock hour could still be heard, moments later, at 12.01. Boom. 40 were killed and hundreds more were injured. And every American was asking the same two questions. Who and why? I'm King Trout, and the allegations about the things I did in the Denny's bathroom in San Antonio, Texas are not true. Sit back, relax, and enjoy as we explore the history of and mystery surrounding a piece of American history which is, in my opinion, far too little known. 1920 Wall Street bombing. But before we get into that disclaimer here real quick, this video is in no way, shape, or form meant to be interpreted or understood as advocating for violence of any kind. Period. Also, YouTube manual reviewer. Hi, hope you're having a great day. You're so handsome or beautiful, whichever you prefer. Again, this is just an educational piece of film. Yeah, you know it's gonna be a good one if it's got a disclaimer. Let's start with some context. When you hear 1920, you might think Roaring Twenties. You know, flappers, Charleston, cocktails, Great Gatsby, all that stuff. Well, the roaring part of the 20s came a little bit later. The year 1920 was actually coming off the tail end of a pretty deep recession. The world had just gotten out of the Great War. Personally, I wouldn't have called it great, but hey, it was their war. They could name it what they liked. It was the war to end all wars. And thank God there haven't been any since. The war is over, and there'll never be another. Most countries in the world's economies weren't doing too hot at the time. Europe still had to rebuild, and America was waiting for all the European nations to pay back their loans. And when they did start paying back their loans, that's when the 20s became roaring. But before then, in 1919 and 1920, there was a huge global recession. Many people at the time were also very upset that it appeared as though a small group of people had made a lot of money off of the war that they had struggled or fought through. For example, if you were a coal miner and you went over to fight in the war, you might come home to find that the owner of the mine had become incredibly wealthy. Or maybe you came home from the trenches of France gazing over no man's land to read a newspaper article about how some elite banker in New York, like J.P. Morgan Jr., had made millions off of the war. You can understand how this made a lot of people mad. But no worries, working man. There are a few upstart political ideologies that are going to solve all your problems. During this time, over in Russia, a revolution was raging. These Bolsheviks, as they were called, led by one Vladimir Lenin, called for a communist revolution the world over. It was time for the workers to unite and overthrow the ruling class. By any means necessary. The ideals of communism, socialism, and Bolshevism were catching on in America. No one had tried it before. What could go wrong? <laughs> Quite a few Americans jumped on board these far left-wing political ideologies at the time. Everybody gets along, we all share everything. Sounds like a utopia to me. How do we get there? Well, they had it figured out. They would achieve peaceful harmony among all men by murdering anyone who disagreed with them. These communistic and socialistic beliefs were quite popular among immigrant communities in the United States. Despite the fact that nowadays people really don't like when you say this, this was a time in American history when you could be the wrong kind of white. And one of the wrong kinds of white you could be in America at the time was Italian. Jim, I know you're a Twitter, watching this, drinking your coffee, consuming your beer, make sure you like and subscribe. An Italian immigrant to the United States, Luigi Galliani, held these communistic views, but with a special twist of also being an anarchist. Ah yes, anarcho-communism, because it can't be a classless, stateless society if there's a state, and it's not like somebody's just gonna strong arm their way into power and rule with an iron fist. What's that you say? That happens literally every time communism is implemented? But that wasn't real communism. But in Luigi's defense, no one had tried it yet. And if you have the IQ of a preschooler, a world wherein everybody gets along and shares everything does sound pretty neat. We still need communism. Ugh. And anarchism, especially far-left anarchism, believe it or not, was actually quite popular at the time. I mean, just a few years prior, an anarchist from Serbia went to order a sandwich and incidentally collapsed the Habsburg Empire, and also incidentally killed tens of millions of people. I'm serious, by the way. Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated because Gavrilo Princip wanted a sandwich. It's a crazy story, but we're not here to talk about that. This anarcho-communist Italian immigrant, Luigi Galliani, led a group which he named the Gallianists. Narcissist. And in 1919, when the American Communist Party and the Communist Labor Party of America came together as the United Communist Party and called for violent revolution through mass action, Luigi Galliani called for the Gallianists to do the same. So in a classic case of what the modern American media would refer to as mostly peaceful protests, 
These communists, socialists, Bolsheviks, and anarchists set about to achieve their goal through labor strikes and protests and a mass-scale terrorism campaign. Wait, what was that last part? Yes, that's right. In 1919, the Galeonists, or as they're referred to in Italian, Galeonists, set about a bombing campaign. Dozens of bombs were mailed or delivered to prominent businessmen and politicians who they disagreed with. This continued through April and June of 1919 until they pissed off the wrong guy. One of the targets they selected was the Attorney General at the time, A. Mitchell Palmer. A Galeonist went to hand deliver one of these bombs to Palmer's home. Upon arriving at Palmer's home with the bomb, the man tripped walking up the stairs, fell over, landed on the bomb, and it blew up. His body basically absorbed all the impact. I know I got a dark sense of humor, but you can't tell me that's not fucking hysterical to imagine happening. Either way, it really pissed off Palmer. In response to these events, Palmer established a small section within the Bureau of Investigation, which was the precursor to the FBI, to hunt down radicals. To lead this so-called radicals division, Palmer appointed a young attorney who was new to the Bureau. A name you might have heard before. J. Edgar Hoover. In a series of raids, which would later come to be known as the Palmer Raids, thousands of socialists, communists, Bolsheviks, and anarchists were rounded up and arrested. President at the time, and one of the biggest pieces of shit in American history, Woodrow Wilson, had recently passed the Sedition Act. The Sedition Act allowed, among other things, for the deportation of foreign nationals who were perceived as being political radicals. You ready for a King Trout hot take? This period in time is generally referred to as the first Red Scare, you know, in contrast to the Red Scare that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, with McCarthy in the 1950s, but I don't think that they're comparable at all. At the point in time of the first Red Scare, the threat of a violent communistic revolution in the United States was legitimate. I mean, there were literally terrorist attacks occurring at the time. Did the Palmer raids overstep their boundaries a bit? You know, what with arresting 3,000 people they believe to be radicals? Probably. Also, the constitutionality of a lot of these arrests was called into question, but most weren't even American citizens, so I don't really care. Listen, I'm not losing any sleep over a few hundred communists who got deported from the country a hundred years ago. The FBI considers it a blemish on their image to this day, though. Like, yeah, that's what you should be embarrassed about. Among the thousands who were arrested and deported during the Palmer Raids was Luigi Galliani himself. Many key leaders of the Socialist and Communist parties were arrested as well. Again, most of these people were not American citizens, but those who were, were put on a boat and shipped to Russia, which they called the Red Ark. The logic of which f***ing cracks me up. We don't do shit like that anymore. They were like, oh, you want to be a commie so bad? But try it out. After the 1919 raids, the dust began to settle. The rioting had stopped, and so had the bombings, until that fateful September day in 1920. On Thursday, September 16th, 1920, at 12.01 p.m., the carriage parked in front of the J.P. Morgan building on Wall Street exploded. Thirty were killed instantly in the blast. Ten would die from the injuries sustained. 143 more incurred serious injuries from the explosion, primarily the loss of limbs. And that's not even to include the hundreds more who sustained smaller injuries. The explosion was massive. Pieces of the horse that had pulled the cart were found hundreds of yards away. A piece of shrapnel was found 22 stories up on a windowsill. Being that it was 1920, many of the survivors of the explosion were World War I veterans. Nearly all of their descriptions compare the carnage created by the explosion to the war they had just come home from. At first it was believed the explosion was an accident. Americans had never seen anything like this before. But since it had only been a few months, the memories of the anarchist and communist bombings of the previous year were still fresh in everyone's mind, including that of Palmer's. It was quickly determined that this explosion was no accident. The cart had been carrying an estimated 100 pounds of TNT, along with 400 pounds of window sash weights, which had been cut into pieces and used as shrapnel. The timing of the detonation was precise, exactly 12.01 p.m., when the streets would be most crowded with those on lunch break. The location where the cart had been parked, directly in front of the J.P. Morgan building, the leading financial institution at the time, the location of which Palmer himself stated in a newspaper interview, had the intended target been the J.P. Morgan building, a better location couldn't have been picked. All that was left was to determine who was responsible for and what their intentions were in executing what would be until the Oklahoma City bombing, the deadliest act of domestic terrorism in the history of the United States. Once it was determined the attack was indeed intentional and due to the similarities it bore to the attacks of the previous months, 
Palmer brought his boy J. Edgar Hoover to come help investigate. There were basically no leads, and no one had claimed responsibility for the attack. Now, the thing with terrorism, and I literally don't know how to phrase this sentence, but um, if you don't take credit for it, it doesn't really achieve your goal. Hopefully that didn't come off as horribly as it, as it sounds in my head. Yeah, whatever. I think you know what I mean. The pieces of evidence were few and far between. It was determined that the horse had been freshly shod, which I learned literally yesterday just means shooed. When you shoe a horse, it has been shod. You have to have a special word for everything when it comes to horses. That's stupid. The blacksmith who shooed the horse was located and was of no help whatsoever. Since 400 pounds of window sash weights had been cut into slugs to be used as shrapnel in the explosion, the investigators attempted to locate anyone who may have more information. Also, a quick interjection here. Maybe you'll learn something. I don't know. A window sash weight, if you aren't aware, is on the old style of windows, the sash, which is the, you know, the piece that has the panes in it that actually goes up and down, would have a rope on either side that would go up and around pulleys into the wall, or the frame of the window, really, where there would be a heavy weight on either side to help counterbalance when you open and close the window. And I can attest, I live in an old home and I've taken out and put in windows. They are heavy as shit. They're astoundingly heavy for how small they are. Interjection over. I hope you learned something about a style of windows that hasn't been in use for nearly 50 years. Now back to talking about the horrific terrorist attack. Investigators asked anyone who may be in the sale of window sash weights if anything suspicious had happened. One man who was in the business of selling window sash weights said that, yeah, one guy came by and uh, asked if he could buy, you know, a few hundred pounds of window sash weights, the heaviest that we had. I didn't really think much of it, and I don't remember what he looks like. I cannot begin to express how happy I am to share these stories with you, no matter how horrific they may be. But if you take one thing away from this video, if you learn one thing, I hope it's that, no matter what line of work you're in, if you're approached by somebody who asks you a question that makes you go, hmm, that was f***ing weird, maybe just remember what their face looks like. Anywho, back to the investigation. While investigators continued looking for clues that might lead them to the perpetrator of the attacks, the question of why was still weighing heavy on everyone's minds. There were theories as to the motive, but again, no one had stepped forward to claim responsibility. If it was an assassination attempt on J.P. Morgan Jr. himself, Bad news, boss man was in Europe at the time. If it was an attempt to shut down Wall Street operations, that failed as well. The next day, it was back to business as usual. Nine million dollars in gold bars were being transported to the treasury just down the street. But they got delivered fine, nothing happened to them. Two days later, on the 18th, a few blocks away, a stack of anarchist flyers was found in a mailbox. Sidebar, I'm unsure how many of these flyers were found. Many of the sources I read said stacks, and others said... Five. Pretty big uh, discrepancy there, but working with what I got. All the sources will be linked in the description of the video, by the way. The flyers stated that attacks would continue unless political prisoners were freed. Hoover and the Bureau immediately jumped on this as evidence of anarchists' responsibility. But this whole thing makes me go, hmm? Two days later, they were found in a post box without any addresses on them. Doesn't seem like a very effective way to get your point across. Even the leader of the Socialist Party of America, when shown the anarchist flyer, responded that, even for an anarchist, it was pretty shitty work. But he, along with every other suspect in the case, had a rock-solid alibi. But then there was one man who caught the nation's attention. Edwin P. Fisher, an attorney and professional tennis player, had seemingly predicted the attack. Fisher had sent multiple postcards to people warning them of the attack, including his sister and a French government official. He warned his sister because she lived in New York and he wanted her to stay safe. Fisher warned the French official because he said he had much love for the French. Ugh. The nation was enthralled, and the Bureau investigated Fisher. The investigators determined Fisher was, and I quote, a harmless lunatic, and then had him declared to an asylum. What did Fisher know that they're not telling us? Probably not much. Uh, you're going to think that I'm, you know, a Fed psyop or whatever, but the, the dude was, he was insane. He was literally insane. He was schizo-posting, like, before schizo-posting existed. But he warned people about the event before it happened. Eh, kind of, but not really. No two of them were the same, and most of them were just vague general warnings. Um, like he would tell people, stay away from Wall Street, just in general, which is actually a good piece of advice. But in one of the letters, he did give a specific date and time. He said, stay away from Wall Street on the 15th at 3.30, something's going to happen. 
Never specific about what was going to happen, but it is bizarre that he got that close incidentally to such a large scale event. Where did Fisher get the information for the specific date and time? Fisher himself stated God had told him the date through the air. Insofar as determining the time of the generally bad thing that would happen, that again, he was not specific about on the 15th, which was not the correct date, the time came to him by a different means. While walking down the street, Fisher saw a 10 of diamonds. Being as diamonds are a lighter of the two cards, he determined the event would occur at 10 in the morning. But later that same day, Fisher saw a 10 of spades laying in the street. Being as spades are a darker suit, he determined the event would happen somewhere between 10 p.m. and 10 a.m., which he then calculated off of Greenwich Mean Time to determine 3.30 in the afternoon, which there aren't any half hours in time zones, but his math, not mine. Also, Fisher had a history of mental illness. He'd been declared to asylums multiple times over the course of his life. His brother-in-law, during this time, was actually attempting to hunt him down to declare him to an asylum because of all the other scary schizophrenic shit he had been mailing his sister. All the weird schizophrenic shit he'd been sending his sister aside from the vague warning to stay away from Wall Street. I'm pretty sure it was a broken clock's right twice a day type deal. Also, when asked by a reporter, since he was clairvoyant, why couldn't he tell who was responsible for the attack? To which he responded, it doesn't work that way. He was on his way to his sister's house when he was first picked up by detectives. At the time, he was wearing a suit jacket over a suit jacket over his tennis clothes. And immediately following the attack, Fisher was almost held up as like a folk hero by people across the country, which doesn't make any sense to me. Like, he didn't do anything heroic. He just allegedly incorrectly predicted a horrific event. Again, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but I spent so much time looking into Fisher specifically. I really, really wanted that rabbit hole to go somewhere. Uh, there is a recurring theme in every interaction everybody describes having with him. The commonality being that he was a fucking weirdo. He would do weird shit and say weird shit to everyone he encountered. Cards on the table going to say that he, he was probably just schizophrenic and got weirdly, you know, lucky, if you want to call that one of his predictions. I was really hoping that there was something there. Oh, there is one weird thing that happened with him, though. During one of the investigations, a piece of paper fell out of his pocket, which was uh, stamped with the logo for a chemical company out of New Jersey. And the investigators were looking for a source of the explosives used in the attack. So this was a lead. Fisher stated that they were collaborators of his. And the thing with Fisher, again, is that sometimes he would say he was a communist. Sometimes he would say he was an anarchist. Sometimes he would say that he had ties to the group responsible for the attack. Sometimes he would say that he worked for the Secret Service. The guy was all over the fucking place because I truly think he was mentally ill. The owner of the chemical plant and his wife were investigated. At first they said they didn't really know of Fisher. Maybe they'd met him once or twice but it later came out that he had stayed at their house before, which does seem like a very interesting thing to lie about. But either way, investigators brought in explosives experts, and it was determined pretty quickly that the chemical plant just did not have the capability to make explosives. Yeah, I looked into, like, everything this dude did and said, and I wanted something. There's really nothing there. I couldn't find any connection between him and anybody else even vaguely related to the attack or to the Bureau of Investigation. Uh, they did commit him to an asylum, but he was only there for like a week before his brother-in-law, who was trying to find him to put him in an asylum, took him out, put him in a different one. He was released a few months later. And the biggest thing that makes me think that he was just some schizo weirdo is, and this is going to sound kind of fucked up, but he died of old age. I know it's, it sounds terrible to say that I don't think he was connected because he lived a full life, I'm happy for him. Sorry that he's suffered through mental illness. Well, it sounds like he enjoyed it, but um, I think if he was connected to anything, he, you know, would have... Something mysterious would have happened to him if you catch my drift. So all the suspects have rock-solid alibis and none of the leads are going anywhere. Want to hear an interesting theory? The author Upton Sinclair, yeah, the dude who wrote The Jungle, that book that we all read about in like 7th or 8th grade or whatever, 
He had a theory. Bureau of Investigation False Flag. Now, my little conspiratorial ass jumped all over that. He wrote in a series of opinion pieces at the time that perhaps it was either an accident or maybe it had been orchestrated by someone on the inside as an excuse by which to continue their investigations into those on the left. A socialist himself, Sinclair said in these opinion pieces, watch, next thing you know, they're going to blame me for it. While Sinclair did recount these statements later in life, it is a juicy little theory. But that didn't happen. All the, all the raids had already happened. They got what they wanted. They didn't clamp down. Actually, at this point in time, Palmer was getting tired of even having to hunt down socialists and communists and Bolsheviks and anarchists. He was just burnt out. He stopped caring. Plus, nobody on the inside really gained anything from it. Nobody gained any power. No laws were changed. Um, you know, nobody moved positions or anything. It was kind of a big nothing burger insofar as the Bureau's concerned. So what was the official finding? There wasn't. It remains unsolved to this day. Everybody's best guess was it was probably some Italian anarcho-communists. And that was that. Media coverage died down. Everybody just stopped caring. Moved on. No conclusion. Who cares? There isn't even a monument commemorating those who lost their lives at Wall Street, which you can still see evidence of the damage done to this day. Years later, in 1940, Hoover, now the director of the FBI, did reopen the investigation, and same conclusion. No findings. It was probably those Italians. Anticlimactic, I know, but it does mark a pivotal and key piece of American history. In the modern day, I hear the sentiment that our nation has never been more divided, far too often. Trust me, we have been much, much more divided. Remember at the beginning when I said 1920, you're probably thinking the Roaring Twenties? This section of American history, post-war and pre-economic boom, is very rarely ever discussed. It's just a footnote. But it was absolutely chaotic. It was turmoil. No one knew where we were headed as a nation or what our core values were. The unity that Americans found in the wake of this event categorically shifted our culture. The day after the attack, Americans across the country gathered in public places to sing songs and raise the flag. And to prove a point, we're Americans, and you can't fucking scare us. be entirely truthful with you, I hadn't even heard of this event until just a couple days ago, and I think most haven't. I was reading a book about a different topic, a topic that you all keep asking me to make a video about, mm -hmm. when I encountered a sentence about the Wall Street bombings of 1920 and said, the what? Immediately after I saw that, I went online and read everything I could possibly get my hands on related to it. I went to my local library, you know, something you probably haven't heard in a long time, to go find any mention of it, I couldn't get enough of this story. And while there may not be any resolution insofar as who was responsible for the attack, what I did find was a tiny piece, an integral piece, of what makes America, America. And whether or not you learn anything by watching me here today, the fact that I'm able to tell you this story and help keep a tiny piece of American history alive, that's all I need. I've been King Trout. As always, thank you for watching. God bless America. Oh, and I forgot to mention that on the day of the attack, $400,000 worth of savings bonds went missing from J.P. Morgan, the modern-day equivalent of $6 million. That was probably nothing, though. Thanks for watching. Uh, you can find me on kingtroutcomedy.com. I'm on all the apps. I basically never upload anything to TikTok because they stopped paying me. Chinese. Uh, Instagram, I go on there. I've, I post shit on Instagram all the time. Uh, I pretend to be schizophrenic. 
It's a great time. Thank you to all of my wonderful patrons. You helped make this possible because there's no fucking chance this one's getting monetized. Uh, I hope to keep doing this. I love doing it. I genuinely, truly enjoy telling these stories, and I, I love the comments. Um, if you could please uh, leave a comment, um, you know, like. If you like my stuff, subscribe. Um, I have heard people... Battery died in the middle of me recording that. Good thing I got it back up. Oh, hey, look, I'm out of focus. I'm not going to fix that. I've been sitting in this chair for four hours. Um, people have said that they were subscribed to me and have come back to find that they were forcibly unsubscribed. I used to think people just did that to get attention. Maybe it's true. I don't know. Make sure that you are subscribed. Hit that motherfucking bell. No, I'm saying ring a ding. Woo! I am losing my mind. I love you. Bye.